We're continuing this this morning in our series through the book of Colossians. We just have a few more weeks as we've worked our way over the last several months through this amazing book in the New Testament. Did you know that the most common faith practice amongst people in our country today is prayer? The most common faith practice amongst all people in the United States today is prayer. In fact, most polls come out somewhere around the same when they survey people in our country. About 80% of people say they pray at least occasionally. Many people say they pray daily. In fact, one that I just found so interesting is 20% of nuns say they pray daily. Now that's not N-U-N-S, that's N-O-N-E-S. That would be religious nuns who profess no specific religion still say that they pray. 20% say that they still pray each and every day. See, if you're a Christian here this morning, you know that prayer is something necessary for a healthy and growing relationship with God. That prayer isn't just an optional thing that we can do if we feel like it, but if we want to grow into the life that God has for us, prayer is a necessity in our lives. See, prayer is something that helps move Christianity and distinguish it just from every other religion, but really helps it be a relationship with God. Because it's in our times of prayer with God that we experience Not just know about, but we experience awe and intimacy with the creator of the universe. But oftentimes, too, prayer in our lives, and I know this has been true for me in seasons of my life, can be a source of frustration, of confusion at times, of wondering what is God doing? Why doesn't it sometimes seem like my prayers are being heard, like my prayers are being answered? In the book of Colossians, which I would invite you to open to this morning, we're in Colossians chapter 4, looking at just three verses today, verses 2 to 4. But in Colossians, after Paul has talked about who Jesus is and what it means to have a life centered and united to him, in chapters 3 and 4, he started to flesh that out in specific application to our lives. And so if you were here last week, we looked at how the gospel influences our work relationships and everything we do. A few weeks ago, we looked at how the gospel impacts marriage and parenting and children relationships. And as Paul continues down, listing now some final applications of, if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, some final gospel implications into our lives, he takes just a few verses that we're going to focus on this morning and highlights how the gospel affects how and what we pray for. That the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, affects how and what we pray for. So Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 2, says this. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And this morning we're going to look at three lessons of prayer from this passage. And the first takes from this first line, very simply, pray with ongoing persistence. The first lesson that Paul has for us this morning is to pray with ongoing persistence. He starts off this verse by this phrase, continue steadfastly in prayer. This is by no means the first time in Scripture that a command or an encouragement like this is given to followers of Jesus Christ. We are told elsewhere that we need to pray continually or to pray without ceasing. We're encouraged to bring everything in our lives, bring everything to God in prayer. In the book of Romans, we're encouraged to be faithful in prayer. And here Paul encourages us to continue steadfastly in prayer. Some translations translate that devote yourself to prayer. It's the habitual practice of prayer in the life of a follower of Jesus. The habitual practice of prayer. Paul is saying that prayer needs to be such a regular part of your life. It's like a habit you have ingrained in that it's not if I pray today, but when I pray. See, that's what a habit is. A habit is something that you naturally do without even thinking about it. Sometimes there's good habits, sometimes there's bad habits. 
I walked downstairs this morning without thinking about it. I went to start making coffee. That's a good habit. That is a good habit. I left this morning and drove into church the same route that I've taken literally thousands of times. I did not look at one street sign or even have to think about where I was going. It's just a habit on how to get here. That natural reaction that it's just a part of my everyday life, it's something that I'm always doing, that's how prayer is supposed to be in our lives. And as we cultivate this habit, it's something that we are to continually do or to continue steadfastly in. Now, I want to make sure this morning you realize that that Paul encourages and Scripture teaches us to continue in prayer, to persevere in prayer, not because God doesn't hear you the first time and so you need to keep doing it. If you're a child of God, God hears every prayer that you have ever said. He knows every prayer and longing of your heart. And so it's not as if Paul's like, well, hey, that prayer didn't work. God might not have heard it. You better pray again and just keep praying because maybe God hasn't heard your prayer yet. No, we know from Scripture that God hears our prayer. But oftentimes, God doesn't answer our prayers right away. And that's why there's this call to persevere in prayer, for ongoing persistence in in prayer. I think there are several reasons why God doesn't always answer prayer right away. There's several reasons why I think God doesn't always answer prayer right away. The first reason I think is, is sometimes God actually wants to purify our desires in what we're asking for in prayer. That we may come to God and ask for something and God says, well, Yeah, keep praying because you're on the right track, but you're not really there for what you really need or what you really should have in your life. And as we persist in prayer, our own desires and our own motives are purified to become more like Christ's. Say, for instance, you're in a bad situation at work and your prayer is, God, would you get rid of all of my coworkers and my boss? (laughs) God says, yeah, try again. Try again. So you're, all right, God, just my boss. Just get rid of my boss. My coworkers can all stay. God, would you get rid of my boss? And God says, yeah, maybe keep trying. You're getting there. Keep trying. So maybe you start praying, all right, God, my coworkers and my boss, they just drive me nuts sometimes. Would you make them stop driving me nuts? And God says, well, you're getting closer. Keep praying until finally you pray, God, it's hard at work. Would you grant me patience? to deal with the people in my life. And God says, you've got it now. You've got it. Our desires by persisting in prayer about the situations and the things we find ourselves in purify our desires so eventually what we're praying for lines up with the will of God for our lives. And as we persist in prayer, God often purifies our own desires. The second reason I think that sometimes God doesn't always answer prayer right away is God wants us to grow in our trust of him. He wants us to grow in our trust of him. See, we know that we need to trust not only in everything from God, but the timing of that as well in our lives. The timing of when those things take place. And as we persist in prayer before God, continuing to seek him, we're actually developing a deeper level of trust in him and in his will for our lives. So think about it. If you didn't have to trust God's timing and you just went to God in anything and he would give it to you right away, he wouldn't be God anymore. It would be like what Pastor Larry reminded us last week, that God is our Lord. Jesus is our Lord, not our ATM machine. We don't just get to go and take out what we want whenever we want, but instead we have to learn to trust in what he gives us and when he wants to provide those things for us. A third reason why God doesn't always answer prayer right away is sometimes God waits to actually prepare us for his answer. Sometimes God waits to answer prayers in our lives because he's actually preparing us for his answer. Maybe what we're praying for is good and it's in line with what God has, but he knows that if he were to give it to us at this second, we're not ready for it. 
We aren't ready to receive that gift that God has for us. And actually, his waiting and us has to, having to persevere in prayer is an act of God's mercy as he's preparing our hearts and our lives to receive the good blessings that God has for us. Could it be that God is preparing our church for our next senior pastor? It's been over three years now. And trust me, you just see it on Sundays. Lots of us are here four, five, six days a week. It's not been easy. There's been challenges. But could it be that God hasn't provided that yet? Not because it's a bad thing, but God is saying, I'm preparing this church. I'm preparing them for the right person at the right time. And in the seasons that we've gone through, we haven't felt the absence of God, but we actually have felt God preparing us for whatever that next time and season would be. It's true in our own lives as well. Some of the things that you're praying for, perhaps God is using your perseverance in prayer to actually prepare you for the very thing that you are praying for. The fourth reason sometimes that God doesn't answer our prayer and so we have to persevere is as we persevere in prayer, it actually deepens our relationship with God. As we persevere and we keep coming back to God and spending time before the throne, seeking his will, seeking what he would have for our life, we're actually deepening and growing our relationship with God. See, it's an amazing thing. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe loves to hear you pray. The creator of the universe loves it when you seek out him in relationship. The book of Proverbs says it this way. It says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. God is delighted when his people come to him in prayer. And perhaps sometimes God requires ongoing persistence in our lives because he simply delights in that growing relationship that we have with him as we continue to persist and continue to seek after the things that he would have for us. God loves it when we come to him in prayer. D.L. Moody said this. He said, some people think God does not like to be troubled with our constant coming and asking. But the way to trouble God is not to come at all. The way to trouble God is not to come at all. That God delights to hear the prayers of his people. And he wants us to persist, to continue steadfastly in prayer. Some of you here this morning have been praying for things for years, for decades. I just want you to know this morning, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. God perhaps is working in your life. He has heard every prayer that you have prayed, and he loves you. Don't be discouraged that it may seem like it hasn't been answered yet. Keep on praying to God. He hears you, and he loves you. Jesus told this amazing example in the Gospel of Luke. And we're told before and that he tells his disciples this so that they would keep praying and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a widow who had an injustice done to her. And she came to a wicked judge and she pleaded for justice for her cause. And the judge ignored her, wanted nothing to do with her and would not grant her justice. But this widow came back the next day and the third day. And the fourth day. And she persisted in coming back over and over until Jesus says, finally, this wicked and unjust judge granted her justice because of her persistence. And Jesus, how much more so shall the perfect father grant justice for his children? He loves it when we persist in prayer. So if you're here this morning and you're discouraged because it doesn't seem like your prayers are working, keep praying. Be encouraged. God has heard every word you've ever prayed. God knows every request on your heart that's too deep for you even to put words to. He knows you and he loves you. Pray with ongoing persistence. The second 
lesson here is also seen in verse 2. It says this, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The second lesson on prayer in this passage this morning is that we need to pray with a proper perspective. To pray with a proper perspective. To not just pray for ourselves or for what we would want, but actually to get a perspective on our life and on our world to pray with a proper perspective. Paul here has two key words that we're going to look at to help us grant what what is this perspective that we should have, that we should grow into in our prayer life. The first is this idea of being watchful. Being watchful or watchfulness. Now, being watchful in prayer does not mean that you pray to win the lottery and you watch the news to see if you've won. It does not mean you pray for a brand new car and you see if your red Ferrari has been delivered yet. You keep watching. That's not what this passage means by being watchful. Oftentimes this this phrase, being watchful throughout the New Testament, is translated being awake or being alert. And the most common times that it's used, actually 12 times in the New Testament alone, is being awake or alert, not as opposed to being asleep, physically, but actually being awake and alert when it comes to looking to the return of Jesus Christ. A watchful person is one who is looking forward to when Jesus will return. We see this, like I said, 12 different times throughout the New Testament. Two examples of this. Jesus says in Matthew 24 in a long um, sermon on the end times, he says this, therefore, stay awake. Same word as being watchful. Stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. In Revelation chapter 16, he says this, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake. Again, college students, that's not an excuse to do an all-nighter because you didn't do your homework on time. It's not staying awake as in not sleeping, but it's staying awake looking for the return of Jesus Christ. See, the return of Jesus Christ is not just something that theologians should debate in seminaries and in classrooms out there, but the return of Jesus Christ has practical significance in our everyday lives. And when we pray with watchfulness, it means that we are praying with the return of Jesus Christ in mind. This week, as I've been studying this passage I have tried to incorporate this into my prayer life. And for me, it's looked something like this. That when I begin to to pray and I get to the part of my prayers where I ask and I make petitionary prayer, I ask God for, for specific things in my life. I just started to add this line and seen how it shaped my prayers. I say, Jesus, because I know you may come back today, I ask for this. Jesus, because I know you, because the reality is he could. Jesus very well could come back today. And our prayer lives need to be in line with that reality. And as we pray, God, in light of the fact that you could come back today, would you see this to be true in my life? Can I ask you for this? Suddenly, some of the worries and concerns and the things that we're so consumed with kind of fade into the backgrounds as we are being watchful as we're living our lives in light of the fact that Jesus is returning and we will stand before him someday, being watchful in prayer, living and praying in light of Jesus' return. The second thing that grants us a proper perspective in prayer is thanksgiving. We said that that we should be being watchful in it with thanksgiving. This idea of thanksgiving and thankfulness is a theme that has run all throughout the book of Colossians. From the very beginning here all the way through chapter 4, thankfulness has been a theme that's run its course all the way through the book. In Colossians chapter 1, it says we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Later in that chapter in verse 12, it says giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. In chapter 2, 
It says that we are rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding, overflowing with thanksgiving. And then in chapters 3, verses 15 to 17, it says that the peace of Christ should rule in our hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, thanksgiving and thankfulness in our lives brings us the proper perspective in prayer. See, we need to be thankful in prayer because we are so forgetful in our lives. We need to be thankful because we naturally are forgetful people. Have you ever forgotten something, sometimes small? Have you ever forgotten something significant? I know, uh, and this is a true story, I know of a couple there was a, a slight medical emergency, and so the husband rushed home, picked his wife up, and they drove down here to Northwestern Hospital here in downtown Chicago. They parked the car, they, they took her in, some tests were run, they had to keep her overnight for monitoring until they decided, you know what, all is okay, they gave some medicine, they said, all right, you're, you're released, you're able to now go home and to rest at home. Very thankful that it wasn't anything life-threatening. They walked across the bridge into that large, I don't know, 10, 12 story parking garage in Northwestern and they forgot where they had parked. And so they start wandering through the parking garage at Northwestern Hospital, hitting the beeper on their car, just like anyone hear a beep anywhere, anywhere. They're wandering through every flight and they cannot find their car. Eventually they call security. Security is taking them up and down in a car. As they're looking for the car, they're driving slow, looking at every single license plate. Maybe the battery had died so they can't hear it, but they had forgotten where they parked the car. Hours of searching through the garages. Maybe someone stole the car. We don't know what happened to it until suddenly they realized they took the wife's car in, not the husband's car. <laughs> and they had been looking for hours for the husband's car, which was parked safely at home, a few minutes later, they found the wife's car and they went home. We are forgetful people. And while maybe you haven't forgotten your car somewhere, all of us are guilty at times of forgetting what God has done for us. When difficulty comes, when trials come, sometimes even when blessings come our way, we forget who God is. We forget what he's done for us. And this call to being thankful in our lives is a call because without it, we forget. That's why so often if you read through all of scripture, if you read through the Psalms, it always is talking about remembering what God has done. Remember the God who brought you out of Egypt. Remember what he has done. Because we so easily forget. Make thankfulness a regular part of your prayers. Because when we are thankful, not just for what God has given us, but when we are thankful for who he is, it puts us in the proper perspective. That we pray looking forward to Jesus' return, and we pray with thankfulness in our hearts for who he is and what he's done for us. Paul continues this passage with a prayer request of his own in verses 3 to 4. He says this, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. The third lesson on prayer that we see in this passage is that we need to pray with great purpose. That we need to pray with a great purpose of our prayers and a great purpose for our lives. There are many things in these two verses that stand out. Paul asks that God would open a door not for him, 
not for his co-workers, but what? Open a door for the word. Open a door for the word. See, certainly Paul was anticipating that he would be the human messenger by which the word was proclaimed. But how he structures this here, he wants to make sure that the Colossians know this, that when they're praying for him, it's not his ability as a person to proclaim the gospel that has any difference. It's the power of the gospel itself that changes lives. That's why it's not an open door for him, but just an open door for the word, because the word is enough to change people's lives. That they would declare the mystery of Christ. This isn't a mystery as in how we often use the word mystery, but as Paul has used it both in chapter 1 and chapter 2. That what was hidden in ages past, the mystery has now been revealed and that salvation is now here for all people through Jesus Christ. That whoever would believe that Jesus lived the perfect life, died on the cross, forgave their sins, took the punishment for their sins, he rose again from the dead and defeated death and through him, we can have a relationship with God. That's the mystery of Christ. That's what Paul wanted to proclaim. And notice how he wants to proclaim it. He asked them specifically that he would make it clear, that he would speak with clarity. Paul doesn't say, pray that I would be winsome or funny or thoughtful or come across as intelligent, but just that he would be clear. Because for Paul, he understood that the gospel itself was enough to make the change in people's lives. He didn't need to add his own abilities to it. He just wanted to present the gospel clearly of all that Jesus has done for us. What's shocking here as well is what Paul doesn't ask for prayer for. He just makes passing mention of it. I love Paul. He makes passing mention. This mystery of Christ, the gospel, oh yeah, on account of which I'm in prison. I'm in chains. Most likely Paul is writing this from Rome on arrest, awaiting to hear trial before Caesar. This gospel of which I'm locked up and don't have human freedoms anymore because of it. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm sliding in a prayer request to to a letter to someone, I'm saying, would you please make an open door for the prison that I can get out of here and get on with my life? And Paul says, would you please pray for an open door, not for the prison, an open door for the gospel. An open door for the gospel. See, Paul was praying with a greater purpose in mind than just his life and just his circumstances. He was praying with a greater purpose than just what he actually would have wanted. See, it is true that you can pray and you can bring to God anything in your life. Any need or desire or request, you can bring that before God. Scripture says to cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. But just because we can pray to God about anything in our lives doesn't mean that's the only thing we should pray about. Just because we can pray to God about anything going on with us doesn't mean that's all that we should pray about. See, I think far too often our prayers are far too selfish. Far too often our prayer life reflects how selfish we are. And while it's true and while you should bring every request of your heart to God, he wants you to do that. We need to grasp this greater purpose of what God is doing in the world. Not so focused all the time on ourselves, but get a glimpse of others and how God could use us to reach them, as Paul reflects here in his request for prayer. See, Paul obviously wasn't planning his life to end up in prison. That's on no one's 5, 10, 15, even 50-year plan for their life. I want to end up in prison someday. None of us have that desire. He would have been perfectly just and fine in asking them to pray for his release. But Paul doesn't ask that, I think, because for Paul, there was something more important than his circumstances, and it was eternity. There was something more important for Paul than just the physical circumstances of, of his life, And he lived his life through the lens of eternity and the difference that Jesus Christ alone can make. 
See, Paul understood that God's plan for the world is more important than our plans for our lives. God's plan for the world and the salvation that's for others is more important than our dreams and our plans for our lives. And maybe instead of being selfish with our prayers and praying about the specific situations we find ourselves in, maybe we feel locked in, imprisoned in certain situations. What if we started, instead of asking just for freedom from those, started to say, God, would you use me here? God, this job is awful. This family I can't stand sometimes. God, this school will drive me nuts, but would you use me here? that the gospel would have an open door in my life. Are your prayers more circumstantial or eternally focused? Are they more just about the things in your life? Are there things that have an eternal significance? If God were to say yes to everything you prayed today, would eternity be impacted or just the present? If God were to say yes to every single thing you pray for, to him today, would lives be changed for eternity? Or would you just get a raise, better job, so on and so forth? We can bring our requests to God. But Paul models for us this greater purpose, the gospel going forth in the world in and through his people that should be a regular part of our prayers. See, there's great power in prayer. Prayer is not just a substitute because we don't have time for other things. There's great power when God's people pray. And when Jesus changes your life, he doesn't just want to change all your other relationships, but he also wants to change even how we pray. That our prayers wouldn't be so focused on ourselves, but instead focused on eternity. That we would persist in prayer, looking for his return, always being thankful that we are called sons and daughters of the king. Don't give up praying. Praying makes a difference that we will never know this side of heaven. Some of the most significant difference makers in our world are people that we will never know the names of. Till one day when we're in heaven, And we'll see the significance of the prayers that they had on our world. Keep praying. God, we thank you that you love us and you hear our prayers. God, may we persist in prayer and not give up hope. God, would we continue to be thankful for who you are and all you've done for us. God, would you use our lives, wherever we have been placed, to make a difference for eternity, that our lives would count for something greater than just ourselves, but would count for you and for your kingdom, for your glory here in this world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.